This week on Quadriga, coalition deal. Will the SPD grassroots revolt? Germany's conservative and social democrat parties have agreed terms for a grand coalition. The conservatives say the deal will boost growth. It's very important for me and my party, the CDU, that we've agreed not to raise taxes. The SPD say their social protection policies are also integral to the deal. The Grand Coalition will not just deal with the heavyweight problems. I want to make it clear that this is a coalition pact for the less well-off, too. But the waiting's not over yet. The SPD's rank and file must first vote on the deal. Only when they accept it will Germany finally have a Grand Coalition government. Your host this week, Ali Aslan. Hello and welcome to Quadriga. For more than two months, Germany, Europe's arguably most powerful nation, has been ruled by only a caretaker government. But now that the Social Democratic Party and the Christian Democratic Union have finally struck a coalition deal, it's in the hands of the SPD members. They will get to have the last say whether this deal will be ratified or not. So the question is, where will this coalition take Germany in the next four years? That's what I want to talk about with three individuals who've been following the election and the coalition talks very closely. Welcome to Andreas Klut, who is the Berlin bureau chief and Germany correspondent for The Economist. Donata Riedel is the financial correspondent for the leading German business newspaper Handelsblatt. And Ulrike Winkelmann, who is an editor for domestic politics at the German daily newspaper Die Taz. Welcome to you all. Andreas Klud, the talks are finally over. The coalition deal has been struck for two months now. They've been arguing, haggling, negotiating, um, pending approval by the SP SPD member votership. Um, this will finally be the government now for the next four years. Now, without getting into the nuts and bolts yet, but if you look at the results, you wouldn't necessarily know who won the election. No, I mean, the, uh, because of that tactical coup by Sigmund Gabriel, the, the chairman of the Social Democrats, to have a referendum, which he did largely for his own political survival, but now that once he announced that, uh, Angela Merkel and Horst Seehofer, of course, realized as soon, uh, that they're negotiating not just once with Sigmar Gabriel and the other leaders, but really with the entire base of the Social Democrats. And they're much harder to convince, and uh, all the uncertainty comes from that. So it was, it was leverage, we would say, uh, that he got through that aspect of the referendum. And that way, the Social Democrats got about 25%. Of the vote, uh, the the union parties together about 41.5 percent. But it, it it you would get superficially if you just look at uh, how they're presenting their various achievements, you would think that it was at, at least e even between the two sides. Donata Riedel, a lot of people, especially outside of Germany, find it rather peculiar that this big country that called Germany as I said, arguably Europe's most powerful nation right now, um, that the election results are now dependent on approximately 470,000 SPD members because they are the ones who now get to have the last say. They are the ones who get to ratify the coalition deal struck by uh, the, the parties. Um, was that a tactical move, Andreas Klut called it, was that tactical move by SPD chief Sigma Gabriel a prudent move? Well, it wasn't uh, uh, um, entirely tactical because, I mean, the rules of the party are that uh, they have to ask uh, their members uh, in important on, on important topics. So they have changed their party rules before the election. So, so they have to do it. Um, uh, and um, yes, but um, uh, if you have a coalition. Uh, you always have uh, uh, to ask the party if they agree. So um, you have party bodies in the other parties as well, so in the CDU and in the CSU, and there are much fewer people who have to decide uh, on uh, the co coalition treaty uh, now. So uh, I think you can't blame uh, the SPD for for doing that because um, they they sort of have to convince 
uh, their own members because for them it's very, very difficult um, uh, to rule again together with Angela Merkel because they have fought against her during the election campaign. And that's uh, the reason why it took so long for them uh, to reach an agreement because uh, on the first hand they, ha they have to get to sort of um, know each other and, um, well, uh, try uh, to get rid of all those uh, um, bad feelings towards each other. So, so that's that's the reason why it took so long. But I, I don't think it's um, it's 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 a catastrophe or, or anything. I mean, it's it just it takes some time, and if it now takes uh, two weeks more, it doesn't matter. And indeed, it must be rather difficult to go from being opponents now to a partner. But let's talk about the SPD members once more. Aside what. Aside from the fact whether this is a prudent move by Sigmar Gabriel or not, is it a risky move? Do you foresee any circumstances under which the SPD membership base would vote not to ratify this coalition deal? It is, in fact, a risky move. And uh, I think uh, that Sigmar Gabriel at first didn't really foresee what might happen. But... Um, it is, I think, possible that the base uh, does not approve, but um, it is more likely that they will really vote in favor of this coalition treaty. But um, it depends very much on the kind of public relation works now being done by the top of the SPD. And so far, they've done pretty well, I would say. Sigmar Gabriel has learned from Angela Merkel in terms of um, expectation management, meaning that if you don't uh, promise too much, you do not disappoint too many. And I would say, if, if you take this coalition treaty now, it will be interpreted the coming days, of course. Uh, you can call it social democratic. So I would, I would say that the base can approve to it. And Andreas Klut, perhaps the hesitations um, um, and suspicions on the part of uh, the average SPD member must be viewed against a historical backdrop because obviously we've already had a grand coalition from 2005 to 2009. Um, and some people argue that it really did harm to the SPD, that the, that the country uh, and rather the party has, hasn't fared very well since then. Um, so do you understand these suspicions of and course. misgivings? I mean, history always, I'm a history buff, and if you look a little bit further, there was another grand coalition in the 60s. They came, the Social Democrats went into that as the junior partner and then came out of that as the senior partner. So, you know, you have one example for one way and then the other example, which is the one in their minds, for the other way. And, and that was in the first grand coalition with Angela Merkel, where they had a bad election results and the Social Democrats blamed that bad result for being the junior party in the grand coalition as if they had done nothing else to maybe deserve it. And so I think there's a, an analytical problem in the base, uh, actually many analytical problems in the base uh, of the Social Democrats, and maybe we can get back to that. But uh, yes, they're afraid of repeating that, and actually, ironically, I think they're equally afraid uh, or they watched with equal interest what happened to the FDP, the Free Democrats, because that was Angela Merkel's next coalition partners. And I'm not saying this is analytically correct. I'm just saying there, there is this impression in Germany that Mrs. Merkel is this kind of voodoo master that just sort of dispatches coalition partners and could be doing this for one more term and another one, and they don't want to be part of that. But of course, there's an unbelievably, I think, powerful argument that CSU, CDU will start making, and voters, even voters of the SPD, is you can't put, I mean, they're trying to argue themselves, talk themselves out of this, but you can't put your party, especially if it's based on false analysis, as I think, but you can't put the next election's result for your party above of, in this case, not just Germany, but Europe, the Eurozone and Europe, and even the wider world, because even though Germans seem not to have noticed this, but a lot of other countries are asking for a lot of help from Germany in dealing with a lot of crises, and right now we're not doing any of that. So uh, uh, the, the base is off in their own la-la land at the moment, and at some point someone has to remind them that there's still a country to be run in a continent. And we're certainly going to look at German, the German election and the outcome in the context of the international uh, discourse. Uh, but once more, is it dangerous uh, to be the junior coalition partner of Chancellor Merkel, as Andreas Klut has suggested? Is this uh, sort of the, the, the kiss he, of death? 
He described the perception of uh, of the part um, of the party members of those parties who lost after being in a coalition uh, with Angela Merkel. But of course, this analysis is is not entirely right because uh, if you see the SPD uh, during the first coalition, at the end of this coalition, they uh, quarrelled about everything they had decided before, and so you saw a social democratic party uh, in 2009. Uh, who uh, didn't know what they stood for. And, and that was, I think, uh, the impression that uh, uh, um, the, uh, the people, the electorate got. And so, so that was the reason why they didn't want to be ruled by the SPD, because they, they, they weren't convincing. So, and that was the same with FDP. Um, it was even worse with them, because um, uh, the, the liberals um, uh, didn't get to really governing. They, they sort of behaved like opponents uh, towards their own government, government all the time uh, during uh, the legislature, um, uh, uh, the last one before this election. So, I mean, uh, you can't blame it on Merkel. Yeah, Ulrike Winkelmann, um, aside from the fact whether one can blame, we can blame a lot of things on Merkel, but perhaps not, the, not, the, uh, not, not this one. Now, there are a lot of people inside uh, in Germany who are saying, um, a grand coalition deal comes at the expense of the other parties in the sense that now the opposition in Germany virtually has no say whatsoever anymore, at least for the next four years, that is. Um, do you see that even as a threat, uh, perhaps, to the democratic discourse within Germany? Yes, I do. I think a grand coalition, especially if it is that grand, uh, is a killer for transparency and democratic values. We have one in five members of the opposition uh, only in, in parliament now, meaning one fifth of the parliament is only opposition, which is Green Party and Left Wing Party. And uh, they are now minuscule uh, in, in a way that they'll be cut off information, they will, they'll be cut off certain procedures. And uh, if the, the rules of the parliament aren't changed, they really won't be seen and won't be heard anymore. And the whole uh, discussion process, which is needed in a democracy also to inform the public, of course, will be down to whatever the SPD and the union pleases to tell us. And if you follow this the last time, which is 2005 to 2009, you could see that discourse and discussion was really dying out in the first weeks only of the Grand Coalition then, and I'm really afraid this is going to happen again. Andreas Klut. I would, I would disagree, um, if I may, because um, um, what you see in, in those situations of Grand Coalitions is that you get um, a different kind of opposition. Uh, you have the opposition in Parliament that um, it's true uh, for them, it's difficult to get heard. But on the other hand side, you have uh, within this very, very grand coalition, many, many opponents within. And they tend to inform the press and, uh, and, and the greater audience. And some of them also tend to work together with the opposition. And of course, um, because the opposition is so small, um, the media know that and they also focus on them and they ask them more directly um, um, what they would not do, for example, during a smaller coalition. So if we look back uh, to the last legislature when we have uh, uh, the, the CDU-FDP coalition, um, the SPD didn't make much of that. They, uh, as an opposition party, um, their job was well um, it was not very good. So, and if you now see very engaged Greens with new people uh, who try uh, to look very precisely on what they are doing uh, uh, in the government, I think there will be opposition. Well, we will see how much opposition there will indeed be left within the next four years. But one thing, Andreas Klut, this German election seems to have aroused the attention, uh, global attention, much more than previous German elections. And obviously the Euro crisis is, is one reason for that. Um, how were these coalition talks uh, being observed by the international press, including your own publications? With a sort of mixture of uh, keen interest and bafflement, uh, amazement, because the German public, uh, I mean, the German voter is hard to understand if you look at him from anywhere, you know, except North Rhine-Westphalia or, or Bavaria in the case of this toll road, etc. I think the, 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 sen the, first of all, Angela Merkel has become globally a, a rock star, a celebrity. And for the first time since 
not even Helmut Kohl was in this position, Ludwig Erhard wasn't, Konrad Adenauer wasn't. You have to go back to the, the evil chancellor before that, when, when the world was so intrigued by a person um, at, the, at, the, at the helm of German government. So there was that, that level of interest. And of course, there was the interest that, that came from the view, the perception, whether it's correct or not, that Germany is the de facto leader of the European Union, and the European Union has this more or less existential crisis, so what will Germany do? And the bafflement starts there as well, given that Germany is so powerful, so successful, could solve problems that we all on the outside worry about, why are you talking about such ridiculously silly things? Because remember, the entire campaign was about ridiculously silly things that you cannot really explain to a rational observer outside. This entire thing with the toll road, this, which the Bavarian side wants, is a distraction. Frankly, this thing that this child subsidy, Betreuungsgeld, will not change Germany's future, Europe's future. It just was fodder for this culture war that they've been having and that they understand and get excited about with a certain reliability. So it, it really went to the lowest common denominator. And if you notice, all the big things were not discussed during the campaign, were hardly discussed now, and maybe that's on Angela Merkel's part, almost, you know, keep the big things out, keep them quiet, and let's really make as much noise as we can about the minimum wage, so, it, so that, you know. So that's the, the view from the outside, is the outside world does not understand why the Germans are so excited about the things they're excited about, and why they seem to have no interest in the things that everyone else wants the Germans to have a view on. Well, what will Germany do, asks uh, Andreas Klut and his uh, readership. And that is actually uh, exactly what we in Germany are as asking ourselves as well, particularly when we look at the next four years. And let's have a quick look at some of the things that the two parties, the coalition partners, have agreed on. Angela Merkel's strict policy on stabilizing the euro is set to continue. Under a grand coalition, Merkel would keep tight limits on debt for both struggling Eurozone countries and Germany. A grand coalition government would see billions invested in Germany's transport systems. The parties also agreed to increase spending on research and development. Germany's switch over to renewable energy will continue, though at a slower pace than the SPD wanted. Agreed labor market reforms include the introduction of a national minimum wage. Early retirement would be allowed under certain circumstances for workers with 45 years of service. And mothers who had children before 1992 will see their pensions increase. In the eyes of its critics, the pension reform proposal mean the deal is weighted in favor of the elderly at the expense of the young. Well, Ulrike Winkelmann, we just saw some of the major deals that have been struck by the two parties. Let, let's go through them uh, one by one. Uh, Europe, we, we left off with Europe and the position of German leadership uh, within the context of the so-called Euro crisis. Now, Europe, as Andreas Klut has pointed out correctly, was almost no issue during uh, the campaign, which is surprising uh, considering its scope. Um, now the two parties have uh, agreed that there will be no mutualization of debt. Do you think anything will change as far as Germany's approach vis-a-vis -vis the euro crisis? I'm afraid not. I agree that uh, Europe should have been an issue and I agree that something should have been changed, especially because before the election campaign, the SPD did indeed have some ideas how to, for example, uh, amend the situation of the young people in southern Europe, which is uh, outrageous. And um, this was all forgotten in the election campaign because the German electorate doesn't like giving money to someone else. So this coalition treaty and this coalition is in effect very nationalistic. And uh, I really think that uh, the, the, the course of the euro crisis will tell and show us that this is not enough. What would you have liked to uh, see changed vis-a-vis uh, -vis the German approach? And of course, the, the unemployment of the southern European youth should have been an issue also for the German electorate. And something like a Marshall Plan, if you want, something like an economic plan to uh, 
embedded the situation of the southern and, and the euro crisis ridden countries uh, sh should have been uh, talked upon in, in terms of solidarity, in terms of helping the euro crisis, the eurozone, in terms of keeping Europe together. We have the European elections coming up in next May and uh, this will then hit down like a hammer that nobody really has a good idea how to, how to solve the situation we are in. Donata Riedel, Chester Merkel has been criticized in the past for lacking a vision when it comes uh, to Europe. Uh, would you agree? Would you agree that this is being reflected by the coalition treaty now? Um, well, um, the, the coalition treaty um, uh, concentrates on on domestic topics, uh, well, entirely. I mean, there are, of course, some, some small uh, um, abstracts about Europe as well, but uh, they don't say very much. And besides that, uh, the policy will be the same as before. Um, but uh, what you have to see is that in all elections everywhere, domestic uh, topics are the issues for the electorate. That's the same in the US, it's the same in, uh, in the UK and uh, in France and everywhere in the world. But we do live in um, extraordinary times yes, when it we, comes yes, to the future of, course, of Europe. Yes, we do live in extraordinary times, but uh, most Germans don't feel it because uh, for us the crisis is over. Uh, we had a crisis in 2009 and uh, since then uh, we, we, um, we had a good development. So, so, so Germans don't feel uh, uh, that there is a huge crisis. It's, it's sort of in, in the background um, and um, I think, think that's um, the reason why uh, you couldn't really uh, put this uh, topic of Europe and the Euro crisis and what has to be done for the southern countries uh, within an election campaign because uh, many, many Germans uh, um, support uh, Angela Merkel's um, politics uh, on this field and uh, the SPD got this sort of um, um, reactions when they uh, they got into uh, the election campaign that when they started talking about Europe they got uh, Merkel's opinion back and so uh, because of that uh, uh, they skipped it entirely. So will we see more of the same Andreas Kluth? Little steps? With respect to Europe yes. specifically? Yes, I think little steps is of course sums up Angela Merkel on any subject. I mean she, she, she's not someone who decides uh, at the beginning to have a grand vision. She signed, she's a scientist and she proceeds with trial and error and I think she, she stumbled into her position that she's now world famous for gradually over time because it's been about three years now that of, of, of full-blown euro crisis and financial crisis before that. She stumbled, she's known for, I mean if you ask someone in Japan or in California what is Angela Merkel for, they'll say the word austerity. And I've noticed that she herself starts because she's very charming and funny, she starts mocking the word Austerität, that funny word she says in German, you know. And, uh, but uh, she, I, think, I think by small steps she will now change and become less austere, which she's wanted to do anyway. Mm -hmm. Keep in mind that the other new development this year and from the election is that there's now the alternative for Germany, which is this close to entering the Bundestag, and will probably in a couple of months, I think, enter the European Parliament. And then, of course, it depends what happens in the euro crisis. If it, if it, it, right now, it seems to be stable and going away, and then that's what Angela Merkel would like, then she can manage that the way she likes to manage everything and basically goes away. And you, you bore everyone with details about banking union, no one pays attention to that, but somehow the countries do recover and we're okay for the next election. If it flares up again, then she has a problem. That could split her coalition, then the official opposition of the left and greens will really pipe up then and of course the extra parliamentary opposition the alternative for germany will because she's walking uh, will will really gain strength because she's walking that tight tightrope where germans not wanting to go further uh, and essentially liking what she's been doing. And we will see which way Germany will go when it comes to uh, the future of the European Union. Um, but let's talk more about the details when it comes to domestic politics, as Donald Arido. As we said uh, uh, from the get-go, the CDU has uh, won this election. There's no debating about that. The SPD lost the election. But if you look at 
the positions that the SPD has been successfully pushed through here. Let's start with the minimum wage. Uh, beginning 2015, the SPD has finally gotten its minimum wage of eight euro fifty. Um, a lot of critics are saying this is not all good news because this will also cost jobs. Will cost jobs particularly in East Germany. What do you make of this? Um, wherever minimum wages were introduced, they did not or hardly kill jobs. So you have no empirical base uh, for claiming that this will, cost, uh, this will cost jobs. Indeed, there's a problem at the German-Polish border because the, 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 the wages are really going down steeply if you cross the border to Poland. And obviously, jobs are more uh, under risk in, in East Germany than in West Germany. But I think that the, the moral value and the materialistic value of a minimum wage for all in the whole country is uh, worth trying it. And uh, every time uh, the, the labor market has found its way out uh, when it was felt that the uh, labor costs were too high. And we have a flexible labor market. We have a big part of the population belong to the working poor. So this was definitely time for the minimum wage now. There was no way around it. So the minimum wage certainly must be regarded as a success, not only for Zygmunt Gabriel, but, but the uh, SPD. And certainly yes, yeah. one argument that he can take to his votership then yes. uh, during the upcoming election. Yeah. The, next, the other success that uh, the SPD could claim is the lower retirement age. Because now, um, you know, for some, for workers yeah. who have contributed to pensions for 45 years, mm -hmm. the, the retirement age has now been lowered from 67 to 63. Another, another, mm -hmm. another good step? Another step in the right direction? Well, I think that is a step in, in the entirely wrong direction. Uh, I mean, I, I agree with Ulrike that um, uh, it was time to have a minimum wage uh, in Germany because we are nearly the only European country who doesn't have one. And so now uh, how they uh, uh, manage to, to get um, uh, um, some two years uh, till it, it, it will also uh, be 8.50 uh, in Eastern uh, Germany, I think, the, uh, um, the the job market can cope. But um, if we look at uh, this uh, new retirement uh, uh, age that has been lowered, I think this is the entirely uh, uh, wrong step because uh, we are an aging society and uh, we put up uh, um, the retirement age to 67 be from 65 because um, uh, this is the case and we have fewer young people who have to contribute to the system uh, with their wages and so anything that um, puts more money uh, uh, to the old generation now, to those who are already retired, is wrong because they are well off because this is the generation who is the uh, is in in the best uh, um, economic status that we ever had in Germany, um, but it will get tough uh, for the younger generations uh, who go to retirement later. And so, if we uh, put more out of the system to the older, it gets tough for the younger. So, so both um, decisions. Are, are really, really uh, wrong and they are too, uh, too expensive in the future when we see um, uh, the baby boomers uh, going to retirement within the next 10 years. And indeed, Andreas Klut, some people argue uh, this is in essence the deconstruction of the so-called Agenda 2010 set forth by uh, Merkel's predecessor, Chancellor Schroeder. Um, would you agree? Um, well, th those two things are different. The, the pension reform raising the age came from the last grand coalition. So the SPD went against what it d did previously there. And then separately, before the grand coalition, when it really ran the government under Gerhard Schröder, it had other f reforms mainly to do with the labor market, which again, the world and I think many Germans also see as a re something to celebrate, one reason why Germany is strong. You see that in both of those things that the SPD was previously involved in. So the, the, pension, the raising of the pension age, which was, was supposed to be the beginning of an answer that had to keep getting more sophisticated as Germany entered this demographic uh, problem. 
and the uh, liberalization of the labor market, which, which was an answer to the Germany as the sick man of Europe that came before, in both cases, the SPD is, is going against what it, it previously did, which is part of this bizarre schizophrenia that we're all witnessing, this, this self-flagellation and so forth. And, and I think actually that's why the SPD has been doing badly in the, in the previous elections and in this one, so it's not Angela Merkel's fault. But yeah, I, I definitely think there is now a, a turn in the wrong direction so there, there were probably excesses in the labor market, you know, things you have to correct. But they want to, I think, go, you know, undo what they've done previously to, to please their own base, based on a flawed analysis. And in the case of demography, which I think is the biggest issue facing Germany, even bigger than the energy problem, the Energiewende, I think if you don't start working on the demographic, by the way, I think just today I read uh, again, new numbers, Germany is the old, has the oldest median age in Europe. I think it's 45. And if you go to parts of eastern Germany, especially Saxony and Oberlausitz, there's only old people. They're depopulated towns. And who's, you know, why would anyone, a young person, want to go to university, start a company, do anything if they're going to be taxed just to pay for those old people? They're going to do that somewhere else. And so this is a way gradually to really hollow out Germany. And a grand coalition is supposed to be, you know, the reason to have a grand coalition is supposed to tackle the grand problem. So if they're, if they're going in the wrong direction slowly rather than fast in the right direction, then th that makes everyone very pessimistic. May oh. I disagree? Uh, of course. <laughs> <laughs> because I, I think the SPD is now rightly counterbalancing what it did wrong in the last terms. You couldn't raise the pension age to 67, that is, without differentiating between white collar and blue collar workers, basically. You, you can't tell someone who is working physically that he has to do this until the age of 67. You can say so someone with an academic education and you, you can tell all those journalists who've been talking about it that they uh, can work until 70 if they like, which they will like anyway, but you can't treat people who do hard physical work just like people who sit at their table every day. But here's, here's uh, what the critics are saying in general about this coalition deal. They're saying you've lowered the retirement age for some, you have raised the pensions for some, but you've also declared that there will be no new debt from the year 2015 uh, onwards, and certainly no tax increase. We're talking about additional spending of approximately 23 billion euro. Now, I'm no economist, but uh, uh, it seems to me that at the end of the day, how are you going to pay? How are you going to pay for these additional spendings without raising taxes? They really have a great trust in the economic growth. They really, they rely on the preceding growth. And this is a risky game, I would say. And for example, the pension plans, which amount to a very high amount, um, they will probably be paid by those who are already very highly taxed and have to pay um, um, very much money into the social uh, sector. I would prefer uh, tax increases in, in order to, to um, make it more, more just and more fair. But um, if they have the economic growth, which has been now um, said that will take place in the next years, they will just about make it. And maybe, but I don't know if they do this, they count on the um, the inheritance tax, because we will have the Constitutional Court ruling on the inheritance tax next year, and they might then really increase the inheritance tax um, because the uh, existing scheme of inheritance taxes is said to be unfair, and the Constitutional Court might be ruling against it. So maybe they, they count on three or four billion from that. So a lot of numbers put forth in this coalition deal are dependent on the German economy continuing yes. to do well. Yes. Uh, in the future. Um, one big issue that also hasn't been much talked about during the election campaign but will be very crucial for Germany's future is energy policy. Mm -hmm. Now Germany after Fukushima has done a big turnaround and is now setting forth the agenda and ambition to um, for renewable energy to make up 50% by the year 2025. That's not too long from now. We're talking 12 years from now, yeah. uh, 12, 11 years from now. Renewable energy ought to make up 50% half of the energy consumption and production in this country. Is this realistic? 
Well, you can do it if if you want to um, if you want to force it because I mean now we are at forty percent or something like that, so um, um, uh, you can can make that. But uh, the difficulty with the renewable you know, renewables is that you have to keep uh, some uh, some something in the background like uh, uh, fuels or gas or or something like that because you don't have the wind uh, every day and the sun shining every day. So so that's not not in this yeah. country. For yeah, not, sure. not in this country. Country, yeah, so 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 that that is the difficulty, and of course you have to do some heavy investment into uh, um, uh, into wires and um, and, um, and and the energy grid, uh, so so that it can cope with uh, um, having um, uh, renewable energy at some points very heavily, and in uh, in other days uh, uh, um, uh, like none, and uh, and you have to put uh, those. Um, um, conventional energy into the grid again, so so that really needs huge investments. And um, so so what they have decided on is that they want to go on a slower path. I think that is intelligent because um, uh, what what they wanted to do uh, before was to, to to move forward even quicker, and um, that was going to be very 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 expensive. And so now I think we will see a lot of rebalancing within the energy sector and. Um, um, not everything is in this coalition treaty, and I think we have to to see how they uh, sort of muddle through and 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 return back on a real, realistic path. I mean, it doesn't help to have only renewables, uh, but um, having difficulties uh, in the entire uh, economy uh, to cope with prices going rocket high. So, so they have to do something about that. Andres, so do you think this government has bit off more than it can chew when it comes to energy policy? Well, I mean, it, it, this government, or at least Angela Merkel's side of it, made the problem by, by doing the switch after Fukushima. So now they have to bite chew that for many uh, legislatures to come. I mean, um, energy, as I, as I mentioned, I believe, along with or probably second to demography, is, is, is a self-made um, challenge for Germany. Because if this goes wrong, then you undermine a lot of the industrial base in Germany that provides the jobs. And uh, as I said, because of the simultaneous labor market reforms, there's other pressures maybe on industry. So if people become unemployed again, as they were in Germany once, then all of this goes into a different spiral. So the, the, ener the energy costs, which are already between two and three times of what, uh, let's say, com competitive in, in certain industries the competitor in America uh, faces, um, uh, is certainly not a, not a positive for German competitiveness. And that's, that's the first task, it, is to preserve that. Because only if you, if you stay competitive can you, you know, make money so you can pay for all the other things you want. Uh, and the energy vendor so far has failed in other ways. Remember, the sort of ultimate, ultimate rationale for it was to lower greenhouse gas emissions. At the moment, they're going up because, uh, because the problem is we're actually becoming more reliant on coal-fired plants because we want renewables to go up, but we don't have a battery for the sun during the day uh, and the wind uh, for when it doesn't blow. So we need backup, and that's coal because we also want to get out of nuclear. And at the same time, the Germans, they have these obsessions, for instance, genetically mod modified organisms is one, but fracking is the new one. And I think the Germans, there's a, there's a, like a, a it's cultural fear of things like that, that I think there's no chance of that. The flip side is that in other places, including Poland next door, they're open to it. And of course, in America, they're having a fracking boom, which they weren't even planning, which makes them suddenly more competitive. So. This energy problem is one they have to get, get to grips on, and the problem is that all the parties, including the oppositions, got muddled. They got into a big woolly hairball about this, and no one can, can tell them apart anymore. Well, this government certainly has its work cut up for itself when it comes to energy, as we're slowly coming to an end. I want to ask the following question, Ulrike Winkelmann. The politicians during the press conference, Chancellor Merkel and Sigmar Gabriel, they were both, of course, content with the, uh, the results they have produced. If you ask the membership base, though, if you ask the SPD membership base, they don't seem to be content. If you ask the CDU once, they say, we made way too many concessions. Um, so there's a discrepancy between what the politicians are saying and what the voters are feeling. Who's the winner here at the end of the day? It'll be the 
pensioners, it'll be the mothers, it'll be the German car industry, because in fact environment has just fallen from the table in this coalition treaty. And I think the SPD base will understand that this coalition treaty is to a large extent a social democratic treaty. And what would you say, Donata Riedel, at the end of the day? You know, we yeah. journalists like to classify uh, <laughs> in terms of who won these coalition talks, who succeeded, who pushed uh, their agenda through more convincingly. What would your take be? Well, I think the Social Democrats uh, won a little bit more than in during the elections. But uh, you also see that uh, the, um, the, the Christian Democrats also won because uh, they don't have tax increases, which was important for them. And uh, actually, they didn't put that much on the table what they really wanted to reach. So in a way, it was easier for the Social Democrats because they said, we have this and this and this points that we want to change. And the CDU only said, well, we want to, to, to have everything like it is. So in uh, negotiating, it's, um, it's more difficult to say, no, we don't want to change, no, we don't want to change, when the other one says, we want to gain this and this and that. And now, of course, the question that everybody is left with and wondering, what will the SPD membership base now do? It's up to them at the end of the day. If they vote no, the deal is through. Um, how pleased do you think uh, they are at the end of the deal? Do you think Zygmunt Gabriel has enough to, uh, to go with to convince them? I think it's a black box, and I think, honestly, we don't know because there's no way of polling them accurately, and I think they themselves don't know. And, of course, keep in mind, it's not 470,000 people voting. It's whoever decides to send it back. And so, actually, a small, num relatively small number of these people will decide this, and I think it could go negative, frankly. I mean, I think we, we really have no idea, and I'll, I'm, personally, I'm just waiting. To, that's my answer, by the way, to your question of who the winners are. Uh, I'm not sure who the winners are or that, if, that there are any, but I think we would all be losers, all in Germany and even around in Europe, if, if the SPD really ha has its blinders on and just looks to little things like, the, is the minimum wage high enough or something? Because what's the alternative? Is that we go? She goes. She, Merkel would have to go back to the Greens for a few more weeks, and then that might fall apart as well. Uh, or we, we, we could be here until Easter. A minority government has big problems in Germany, and then we might have new elections, so we could be well, without a government for a lot longer. Uh, thank you. Well, we certainly won't be here until Easter because this show, unfortunately, has now come to an end. We will see how this government will rule this nation for the next four years. Thank you to my guests for a very insightful and spirited talk, and thank you out there for tuning in. Looking forward to seeing you again next week for a new edition of Quadriga.